Hi folks, Tom Coy with Ann Arbor Shield. We are now on our fifth segment, I think, I hope. And um, they tell me in the studio that our uh, audience has grown by five. So for the five of you that are watching, in addition that were of last week, thank you for being here. Um, in the studio today, we have Officer Rob Schneider and Probation Officer Joe Royal. I appreciate both of you guys being here. And uh, it did cost me lunch, which I still owe Joe. But anyhow, that's how, that's how desperate I'm seeking colleagues on the show, all right? <laughs> it's gotten to the point of being embarrassing. I have to beg. Um, anyhow, today in the studio, we're going to talk about uh, primarily two topics. Uh, the first one is going to be shoplifting, and the second one is going to be uh, parking lot safety. Uh, and that's not what you think. This isn't about how to cross a parking lot uh, safely, but some, some good hints for you especially this time of year. So um, if we're ready, why don't we uh, cut to the two uh, videos on shoplifting. New this morning, a principal's fired and suspected of shoplifting. Melissa Clark was the principal at Clyde Boyd Middle School in Sand Springs. Well, officials say that she had $140 worth of merchandise that she took from the city's Walmart. But listen to this. Police say that she was involved in a similar incident at the same store two years ago. But she came to an agreement with the store's management then. Clark is scheduled in court next month. A metro robbery goes wrong. Now a woman is in jail. Two people are still on the run, and a security officer is recovering from a stabbing. Midwest City Police arrested Michelle Turner for the attack, and everything was caught on tape. Eyewitness News host Jessica Holloway is live with the latest. Jessica. Paul, the suspects led police on a chase through this parking lot and down the road, but really it all started inside this Target store. Three suspects tried to steal electronics. A security guard stops them and a fight breaks out. They drop the merchandise, but the man comes back for it. And this time he has a knife. Police say he stabs the store security guard. Then the three take off, leading officers on a high speed chase for less than five minutes. When the officer performs a tactical move to knock the car off the road. Okay, um, when, I, when I was uh, asked why we're doing the shoplifting segment, uh, you, you always ask yourself, well, you know, what's the motivation here? What are we trying to accomplish? And I was talking to Officer Snyder earlier about this. And really, it's, it's twofold. One, I was, we're hoping to dispel some of the myths that people have about shoplifting. That is to say, if you were to ask most people, I think shoplifting is equated with some sort of prank that teenagers pull, and, and it's relatively a harmless quote-unquote crime. Um, and the, the other aspect of um, the shoplifting segment, I wanted to just take a real cursory glance at, you know, the, the general profile, if you will, of an average shoplifter. And again, this is all kind of from a boots-on-the-ground perspective, which I prefer. I'm, I'm sure we could delve into all kinds of uh, uh, educational studies with regard to the profile of a shoplifter and thing, but um, I prefer to talk to people that are uh, out there doing the job. So um, on the heels of, of what we just saw here, I think most people would be taken back, um, by, especially by the principal that was shoplifting. And uh, so I went online and I pulled up statistics this year from a, a very reputable source. So I just want to throw those out and uh, they'll be on your screen here as well. But I'll make it kind of a, a question answer thing for, for the audience. Uh, did the, the cost of the US in shoplifting is how much, or how much was it? Well, how much was it in 2014? Answer: 44 billion with a B. True or false? There does not appear to be a typical profile of a shoplifter. True. The vast majority of shoplifters are adults who started shoplifting in their teens. True or false? True again. You guys are doing well. There will be a gift at the end of the show. That Joe's going to buy. <laughs> Joe's going to buy. Um, uh, offenders, when, when apprehended, are only prosecuted half of the time. And that is also true. Let me, let me throw this out here, and uh, I'm going to ask these guys later on. But when it comes to prosecution, especially of juveniles, my experience has been that a lot of retailers are remiss to do that because they don't want to, quote unquote, ruin their life. Um, but I hope to touch on some of the things that, that may be 
going on behind the scenes of, of some of these shoplifters and that, and Joe will speak to this, that if, I, I know it sounds ironic, but if they are arrested, there are certain programs that they have to participate in order to be uh, part of the, what we call the first offender program, which we'll touch on. But bottom line is you're not doing them any favors by looking the other way or, or slapping the wrist and telling them to get out of the store. Statistic after statistic shows, just as it does with um, writing a citation versus a verbal warning, that is much more effective to prosecute the first time for a, lot of, for a variety of reasons. Um, the majority of shoplifters steal because of internal and external stressors in their lives. And that is true. This, I, I thought this was very interesting, and Joe and I were talking a little bit about this earlier, but um, when they surveyed a lot of shoplifters as to why they did what they did, because it's not uncommon, as we saw in the video here with the, uh, the teacher, um, she obviously has a good job and is, um, has a place in the community and so forth. So you ask yourself, what was going on there? Um, and so what they did find in the study was that a lot of uh, shoplifters either suffer from, you know, some sort of depression or, you know, low-key low uh, mental illness and or substance abuse. And essentially what they did is they did it uh, for the high, they call which wouldn't make sense, right? I mean, I'm no psychiatrist, but if you're depressed and your serotonin level is way down here and you get a high from shoplifting, it would seem that, right? So that makes a lot of sense. Um, so if, if you guys don't mind, uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about, uh, about the video and so forth. But Joe, now you've been doing this how long? 14 years. 14 years. And in, in 14 years, and again, this is generally speaking, of course, this isn't uh, don't send me a bunch of emails. Hey, that's not right. You know, I found 14.2 and all that. We're, we're talking generalities here. Um, in the 14 years, what, give me a typical uh, profile, if you will, generally speaking, of the folks that, that come to you after being arrested. They come to you and just take us from start to finish, if you will, and maybe if you have a couple what we call war stories in there. Well, I would agree with the, the statement that there isn't a common profile. There is not a a thing you can look for and say that's that's the segment of the population that's going to steal. Um, generally speaking, we see probably three groups. You see a younger group of teenagers, uh, college students who do uh, go into the, the department stores and go into the mall and they do steal. Um, the surprising, what surprised me about that segment is oftentimes they have more than enough money to cover whatever they stole. Uh, well, when, then what, so when it comes to the teens, I mean, are they doing it on a dare? Are they doing it, you know, a fraternity? I mean, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But. A lot of times it's um, my friends have done this. My friends have been getting away with this. So they said how easy it is. It, it's, it's communicated to them through their peer group that this is how you do it. It's, ah. it's easy to do. No one ever gets caught. The few that do, they just get let go. Okay. Um, Which goes back to what I was saying earlier, right, exactly. about the process, how critical it is that essentially that, that they're, hold, they're held responsible for their actions, right? Would you right. agree with that versus, versus saying, well, just get out of my store and we'll call it good for the day? Yeah, oftentimes they're shocked at the consequences that come along with a, a conviction on that, you know, the amount of money that they have to pay the court and fines and sure. the classes they take and the community service. And, um, you know, they think it, this is not a big deal. Right. Why are we treating it like a big deal? So how does, uh, talk us through, if you will, um, Let's, let's take somebody who's eligible for the first offender program and what does that typically involve for them and who is eligible and who isn't going to be eligible for this? Generally speaking, to be eligible for the first offender program, you have to be a first time offender, um, have nothing else on your record, um, and you... Um, is, there a, is there an age thing there? There's two different programs. Okay. There, there is a first offender program that um, if you are under the age of 21, you qualify for, it's called the Homes Youthful Training Act. Okay, okay. And that is a program that's available. Um, and if you fulfill the court's orders, that the, the case is dismissed. The second one is the first offender program that's offered to those that are older than 21. If they have never been in front of a judge before, they may qualify for that. Um, and the same principle 
at the end your case is dismissed assuming you successfully complete the conditions of probation. Okay. Can you give us, um, I have done, I mean, I used to do transports and so Joe and I worked together. Um, and I know that there are classes um, that are required. Can you give us some typical classes that are required for them yeah. to participate in? Um, there are a couple private agencies that offer uh, economic crime class. That's generally a one or a two day class. Um, and that's offered to a first offender. Um, generally, it's a pretty soft overview of, of the kind of problems that shoplifting cause, give you some education as to uh, the type of people that are in that class, and um, some of the cost to um, the consumer, some of the cost to the stores. Uh, it's a real general overview. And that's meant to just kind of educate someone who is not experienced in this world and it hasn't done this. So. Okay. A lot of times. With, with the, and this is, uh, I'll throw this out to both of you guys, but let's, let's uh, switch gears a little bit and go to the repeat offender. What do you find in your experience in years uh, of service, what do you usually find going on there? Let's say this is their second, third, or fifth, whatever, uh, time that they've done this. What's usually going on behind the scenes? Usually, I would agree that there's a mental health issue. Uh, oftentimes, it's depression. Um, there's a real correlation between um, depression and, and shoplifting. Um, and then some of it is uh, people will shoplift on anniversaries of a significant person who died or uh, an anniversary of, of, of something important. Um, and they do go out not feeling good about themselves and for whatever reason they feel compelled to, to steal. Um, we see that a lot, a lot more than than I, I would have ever thought. And these are your, the, the principal that we saw in the clip, mm -hmm. um, doctor's wives, um, I've had a couple of nurses. I mean, these are professional people. I have an uh, elderly person on probation who has shoplifted a couple of times. She actually went overseas over the summer. And um, when she came back, uh, she shoplifted again. Mm. So here is a person with with plenty of money. It's not about the money. It's it's about fulfilling some other need for yeah. her. Well, I I found it really interesting uh, doing some reading. Um, one of the things we saw Rob in the in the uh, other clip was how this simple shoplifting with these guys at Target escalated into um, you know a stabbing, and then that escalated into you know the, the pursuit. So, and I know that you worked on the south side, which uh, involves a lot of retail area there, and we were commenting on, on lunch that you weren't there for. Um, that, that um, you know, a lot of times when you encounter these, these folks that are shoplifting, there, as Joe pointed out, not only is there a lot going on behind the scenes with them personally, but it often leads to other crimes, and then you, then you have the, uh, the whole retail fraud uh, rings that are operating out of a major uh, city, my understanding, the south of us here. And it's almost, I mean, I remember reading that article, it was like Amazon, you know what I mean? Uh, folks were sent out every day, you know, to fill an order, uh, and they would go out and fill these orders, bring it back to the warehouse, obviously given a percentage of that uh, money. And that was a, is a huge business, as I, as I pointed out with the stamp. But maybe you can comment on that. And again, um, some of your uh, war stories, if you have some of those. Uh, you know, a lot of the shopliftings uh, that we run into, some of them start out as the miner uh, who goes into the store, picks up, you know, a couple packs of gum or something, all the way up to stealing a shirt, depending on the department store. Um, the situations, as we had seen in the video, in which, you know, results in the stabbings or mm -hmm. the uh, car chases, usually those will tend to be more of our... Um, higher organized crimes, um, you know, such, it, it's come to a, such a head that the uh, state has been able to ch start charging people under the RICO statute um, because it is an organized ring that's coming out and profiting off of the shoplifting. So, you know, in my career, uh, we have seen, you know, things change um, to where they've become more aggressive. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a city nearby in which, uh, you know, patron decided to shoot at the uh, shoplifters. Um, 
you know, it's it, it's costing everybody money. Right. You right. Know. And and a lot of these shufflers play, for, you know, they uh, they play for keeps. This yeah. isn't <laughs> it isn't it isn't a game with some of these folks. This is their livelihood you're messing with, and and in some cases. Um, you know, an apprehension is going to send them back to prison, so um, it's not a game to them. Um, anything the, else you guys can think of that uh, throw in while we're on this? One of the things that I want to uh, make mention is the um, statistics that was presented. That's only the statistics of people that actually got caught. Mm. Not Good point. the ones that had actually got away with it and have point. gone unreported. So again, it's it's costing stores lots of money, which in turn, they shuffle it down to the the general public to help pay for the sensors and the alarms and and everything um, for security. Yeah, in that's, that's that's interesting. You bring that up because I was at a uh, a retailer the other day who um, deals with high end um, outdoor clothing, and they had they had uh, gone away from the ink uh, sensors because they were being removed and they had to go to a motion sensors, but that cost them $45 a piece to do that. So you're right, I mean, it's, it costs an incredible amount of money uh, to, to retailers and uh, customers alike. Um, Rob mentioned something, Joe, a little earlier about the people that, that come to your attention. When they finally get to the point of being apprehended, uh, now they're in the court system, now they're having to uh, deal with a probation officer and, and all those things. What do you usually find at the end of that? That is to say, they've, they've successfully completed this program, um, and I know it's not easy, I know a lot is required. Do you find you know, a, a high percentage of recidivism, a return to shoplifting, or do you think there's an awakening for something? Do you have any idea? Just in your opinion. We don't see a lot come back through um, the court system. Um, certainly there is a percentage that does, but I, I would think that's a, a small percentage comparatively, um, especially with the younger, uh, younger crowd. They realize that they've gotten this break. This is, uh, they have the potential or the opportunity to keep this off the record. And we really stress the um, difficulty in getting a job in, in your future yeah. if you have a retail fraud on your record. I mean, that's who wants great, to hire that's you a fantastic if, if you have point, that? Yeah. So I, I think if that point is driven home, oftentimes they're able to grasp onto that. Uh, and they're able to, to see that all this money that they've spent for the classes, for the fines and costs, is not worth you know, the t-shirts the and whatever yeah. they're stealing. That's a great point. We're gonna transition a little bit. We're gonna stay with shoplifting, but I'm just gonna uh, speak to the retailers for a minute. So uh, before we do that, um, from each of your perspectives, what would be your one caveat, if you would, if you know, as we speak to retailers with regard to shoplifting in general, prosecution. Um, I mean, what, what would be the one thing if, if your sister had a if your sister had a business here in the city, and um, it came to your attention that she had not been prosecuting for the most part people? What what would be the one thing you would tell her? Well, I, I think something that gets lost on the retailer is is Oftentimes, that there's more to what's going on with the person shoplifting than simply someone who's stealing a T-shirt. Um, sometimes there's a drug or alcohol issue, mm -hmm. and if they do prosecute, that can be brought to the attention, and that can be dealt with um, through the court as well. You know, we have classes, we have uh, all sorts of things available to, to people who are in that situation. But if they don't prosecute, then that that's it, just going to get delayed and. and you know, this person's going to continue to steal to support a habit and, yeah. until that habit's dealt with. And it's kind of a paradox, isn't it? I mean, I, I know that, and I've heard this when I was working in the court before, but you really, the only way to enter into the system and take advantage, if you will, of these programs is to be arrested yes. and prosecuted. I mean, to say that you need help and, and uh, I'd like all these programs and stuff uh, for no cost, so to speak, isn't going to happen. I mean, right? I mean, it, it does sound a little ironic. It is, it is, it, and it's, it's too bad that it is that way, but the reality is once you're in the system, then a lot of doors can be opened and you know, treatment options are available. Um, yeah. um, Rob, what would you, I mean, what would you, you certainly dealt with a lot of retail. I, you know, I have to agree. Uh, the biggest thing with us is that we, ha we tend to go and visit the stores to see how things are going 
we engage with the community, um, talking to the business owners, mm -hmm. and you know they make mention of people that that have come in, shoplifted from a, from them, and have left. And we'd like to know these things. We might, you know, we want to know who's who because I'm sure if they've have stolen from this store, Absolutely. what other stores have they hit and not, not been reported to us? So one is, you know, we'd also like them to prosecute. You know, it might be where they end up with a record, and it's unfortunate, but that may help the person get some help. Yeah. Second of all, it if there is subsequent uh, return visits by these parties, um, you know, it may help us further with prosecution and and being able to get them more help. Yeah. No, that's um, so good point. it creates a, a track history for us. And we do have some individuals that are out there that have an extensive criminal history for doing such things and may end up being recognized on the, um, you know, falling into the RICO, RICO organizations, yeah. you know, or the shoplifting organ, organizations. Good point. Um, at, the, at the conclusion of today's show, we're going to have, uh, I'll throw up some um, helpful hints for retailers. So that'll be up on your screen, so stick around for that. It's also on our... Uh, and our police uh, website under um, community uh, engagement. Okay, if you want to take advantage of that, but take a look at those hips, tips. I think they'll be helpful for you. I thank both my guests for being here again today, and um, stick around because we're going to transition into parking lot safety after this humorous video. I found it humorous, anyhow. All right, Rob. So you were saying uh, we were just talking about parking lots and the chaos that ensues, especially around certain times of year, but in general. Uh, and this is a good example of it. You know, you had the black SUV park. <laughs> I don't know what they were thinking. They park there. This poor guy is stranded. He can't get out. This is kind of humorous because they have little ants running around. But, <laughs> and, they, and they take this uh, bizarre approach to having to move the other vehicle. But that, it's just insane. It's crazy. And you were, you were saying something about a speedway incident? <laughs> Yeah, not too long ago, I had a car that blocked me in. Person or the driver exited the vehicle and decided to go into the store, blocking me in. <laughs> so I had to get out and try to find them, track them down. And it turns out they were having a medical emergency and totally didn't even see me. So once I made contact with them, we were able to get the vehicle moved and just incredible, help them out. just incredible. See, um, I, I don't have that luck of having people come out and help me. <laughs> <laughs> so. I get it. Okay, we're back in the studio. Um, Joe Royal has left us for other things unknown, and uh, Officer Snyder is still sticking around as we um, progress into the parking lot safety segment. And pr primarily, we're going to talk about two different things um, personal safety within the parking lot and larceny from vehicles, as well as larceny of vehicles. Um, a lot of the times when you get massive parking lots, I hate to say this, but it's a target-rich environment for bad, bad guys, bad gals, um, because you have so many people and so many vehicles in a concentrated area, and it, it really is, um, it's good shopping if, if you leave your stuff unlocked and so forth. So with that uh, being said, let's take, take a look at a couple of videos here, and I, I thought they did it well with regard to um, personal safety and uh, some of the other issues we were talking about, and then we'll come back in. So you have these keys out already before you leave the store, before you get out of the car, and you hold it like this. You take the longest, sharpest key, and you put it between your index and middle finger, just like that. That way, if anybody jumps out and surprises you, whack, right in the eye. Okay, another thing is, is you take the lovely purse here, and you put it over the shoulder, your arm on top. This helps to avoid the temptation of someone who would run up and snatch your purse and maybe do worse. Okay, and also, as I approach my car, if you look, we have this glass here it gives me a nice reflection. I can see anything that's behind me. Also, I have reflection on the paint. I can see shadows on the ground. I always want to keep my head on a swivel, paying attention to my surroundings. I don't want to approach the car if there's anyone hanging around my car. Uh, I don't want to go too close to any spaces in between parked cars where someone might be hanging out. 
Um, I don't walk through the parking lot talking on the cell phone or admiring my purchases. I always need to be alert. And in my book, I talk a great deal about situational awareness, always being aware of the situation and your surroundings. And I've always said that the easiest way to avoid becoming a victim is never giving a bad guy the opportunity to make you one. Tip one, at night, park in well-lit areas and walk to your destination in the light. Tip two, park near other cars or in an area with a lot of foot traffic. Avoid parking your car in isolated sections of parking lots. Tip three, always lock your car doors and make sure your windows are rolled all the way up before you exit the vehicle. Lock your doors as soon as you get back into your vehicle. Tip four, do not leave valuables or shopping bags out in the open. Before you leave your car, store these items in the trunk or under the seat. Tip five, when walking in a parking lot, be aware of your surroundings. Okay, um, there was a reason I, I had uh, the folks repeat the awareness issue, uh, that is to say, both of them spoke to that. And I think Rob would agree that if, if you don't remember anything else we talk about today, when you're in the parking lot, be aware of what's going on around you. Don't be on the cell phone and distracted with other stuff because I'm telling you, they're watching you. And if they see somebody that doesn't have their head in the game with regard to leaving wherever you're, you know, the mall in this instance and going to your car, they're going to cue in on that versus somebody who is very alert and looking around. Agree? Totally agree. I mean, just be cognizant of people around you there. Um, before we uh, cut into the personal safety thing here, we were talking a little bit, and again, you work the south side, and with that, it's a lot of retail. Um, that larceny from, what we call larceny from vehicles, or essentially people entering vehicles and removing items from it and stealing it. Um, can you just speak to that a little bit? And they, they talked about it a little bit in the video, right? Um, simple things like keeping your, your vehicle locked and keeping valuables out of sight, but can you just speak a little bit how often that occurs and, and if you get a larceny, what, you know, what has transpired? Has the, have the doors been unlocked or what have you? So. Uh, as far as the thefts go, um, you know, just mere walking by. And anytime you walk by a car, you know, if you take a look, you'll see all kinds of stuff that are sitting out there. Oh. Uh, you know, from pocketbooks to laptops to, you know, very expensive, valuable items. You know, cell phones are being left there. Matter of fact, I just talked to my daughter about mm. leaving hers out in the open. She didn't carry it with her. So, you know, hide the stuff. We, we want it hidden, you know, it can't be seen. People don't know it's there. Yeah. Um, so definitely so if my argument to you is, well, I'm going to leave, uh, I'm going to leave my laptop in the car, but I always lock it and roll the windows up. Make sure it's hidden. And if there's a place that you can lock it up, whether it's in the trunk or it makes it tougher to get to, then no. that's even better. Uh, glove compartment, you know, we want to make people work for it. If they're going to do it, they're going to do it, but let's let, have them work for it. Yeah, yeah. Don't just make it easy for that, them. That's, that is an excellent uh, point. As far as the thefts go, you know, we get people that will break the windows. Um, you know, again, making them work for it versus leaving your do doors unlocked. Yeah. Um, you know, any chance you can get to hide this stuff or put it, take it home, drop it off, have a friend take it, you know, even better. Yeah. What kind of, what kind of stuff, um, I mean, when we're talking massive parking lot here, uh, like a mall situation, what kind of things typically go on uh, with regard to law enforcement? You know what I mean? Um, you just spoke to larceny from vehicles, uh, and I know that uh, we've had larceny of vehicles, uh, but maybe you can speak to a little bit. I mean, usually when you look at a parking lot, a massive parking lot, you wouldn't think all this stuff is going on, right, uh, with regard to uh, vehicle crashes and everything else, but it's it's a pretty busy place if, if there's a lot of people moving around. So, Correct. Most of the time, people are from the car to the business, and they don't pay attention to everything going on around them. Uh, for those that are, are watching others to take for that yeah. opportunity, they'll be sitting in a parking sp spot. Makes, you know, they look like the average citizen, 
just waiting for somebody when they're actually casing, you yeah. know, watching you walk from the store with your gifts and placing them in the car. Um, you know, we try to tell people don't hesitate to call us. Uh, we can't be everywhere at once. We do take our patrols through the, the parking lots uh, looking for anything out of the ordinary. And if you think it's something is suspicious, if the hairs on the back of your neck are mm -hmm. starting to raise up, you know, somebody's watching you as you're going through, call us. Yeah. By you, all means. You, you bring up a great point. Um, a lot of the uh, meetings we've had recently, it seems like there is a huge misconception, if you will, as to when to call 911. And, and honestly, a lot of people think the only time I should be calling 911 is if, you know, an airplane goes down in my neighborhood or, you know, my, my neighbor is having a heart attack or something. And what you just spoke to is huge. That is to say, the time to call 911, and I totally agree, and that's actually that's what I tell people, is that if something looks really weird, out of place, something doesn't fit, these people don't belong here, or something's not right, um, call 911, have a car come out, have us check it out prior, you know, rather than waiting for the crime to be committed, um, a lot of times, if, if people call, that's, that's our best tip. I mean, it's a, it's a team effort. So calling us and having a car slide by and asking, you know, this isn't your car, what are you doing in, the, you know, what are you doing in it, is, uh, is a good way to, to prevent a lot of that stuff. Um, what, what, what's going on with um, uh, what we call uh, UDAs or uh, the stealing of vehicles themselves uh, in your experience? I had a film, I don't know what happened to it, it doesn't matter. But, um, you know, it shows two guys working in conjunction with, with each other. One guy's out in the parking lot scouting out cars, looking for keys in the ignition, you know, uh, windows down, very easy prey. And the other guy is staying mobile on the phone, obviously, letting him know that, you know, I don't see any police, I don't see any security, go ahead, you know. Um, because, again, this is a, a huge target-rich environment. You know, when you're talking thousands of cars, so I don't, I don't know, and, that, and I haven't worked the road in a while. I, I hear the laughter already. You still don't work. Um, but I haven't worked the road in a while, but what's going on with regard to, you know, uh, the, the uh, vehicle larcenies and so forth? Uh, they're still happening. Uh, you know, just keeping track of your, you know, your keys. Uh, once they're in there, it looks like any other citizen just sitting in the car. Right. And right. while people are driving by or walking by, they're busy hot wiring the car or jimming the car so it starts yeah. and away they go yeah. and so just you know all we can ask is just people pay attention to what's going on around them and and call and if i mean you see a couple guys cruising in the parking lot and they're not buying anything you call us and don't wait for them to break a window or something give us a call and, and say hey you know what you need to check this out and see what's going on here um well i think i think that's it i can't Anything else you can think of with regard to anything we've talked about today that you, you want to throw out there? Um, I think just, uh, you know, watching the video, I, I think, you know, they really hit it on the head. You know, please keep in mind, if you have a key fob, um, not only can you place the keys in between your fingers, but you also have an emergency button on yeah. it. As long as you're within range of your vehicle, it's not, you can hit that. I don't know how many of you are walking down the street when you hear the alarm going off. You tend to look. That's it's just, that's a great, new, you know, human behavior. So, you know, keep in mind, if you have the ability to use that panic alarm, that's what it's for. Yeah. Um, don't be afraid to scream, you know, talk, yeah. yell real loud. It'll yeah, draw they, attention. Yeah. The bad guys don't like noise. They don't, they don't want, they don't want attention directed to, you know, the victim or what's going on. That's the last thing they want. So that's a, yeah. that's a great point. If you see something out of the ordinary, you know, if you can get a description, that's, that's huge. Um, put it in your phone. Tell a friend, you know, we'd like you if you're, you're out shopping, if you can go with a friend, you know, twos, work in pairs, um, works yeah. great. Um, but, you know, try to get a description of, of the people that are involved in any of these. Yeah. And, and, and here's my point of confession, all right? When, when we get on the airplane and they go through the rigmarole of, you know, watching the stewardess or the film or whatever it is on the safety... I'm not watching. I, I'll be honest with you. I got, I'm usually reading a book by that time and so forth and so on. And so I'm sure that there's a segment of the audience that's listening to us, including my, my precious wife who's saying, sweetheart, you, you know, you're a little over the top sometimes with the safety thing and, and everything else. But what we're sharing with you isn't paranoia. It's if, 
again, if you don't remember anything else, remember awareness and to call 911. If something doesn't feel right, and, and like Rob said, the hairs on the back of your neck are standing up or something just doesn't seem, call 911 and have a car slide by. But be aware, especially this, this season. Your biggest, not, I, think your, I think your biggest enemy is the complacency. Yeah, no, it, that's true. That, that'll get you every time. Yep, yeah. and this is very true in our job, by the way. But um, uh, I have a, a parting thought, and uh, Rob is, uh, is responsible for this, and I think it's good information. Um, and I can say it uh, because I've had to learn it myself. I have an hour, hour and a half commute one way every day. And when I started doing that commute, um, my patience level was not where it should have been and it could have caused me a lot of problems and did on occasion. Nothing physical, but I mean, you know, with a tirade and all that stuff coming home in a bad mood. And um, the bottom line is, folks, especially this time of year, but in general, as you saw on the film, and, and we've alluded to, slow down in your car and, and in your personal life. If, if your life is that out of control that you, you gotta park like this to run in there for 20 minutes, if your life is that out of control that one minute, two minutes make that much difference, all I can say is you, you really gotta look at your priorities because it's gonna lead to a ticket or, or an assault or something. That's my experience. I think Rob would say the same thing that a lot of stuff we deal with, especially when it comes to traffic-related crashes and everything, it's all about time and trying to carve out one extra minute or whatever, and it's just not worth it. All right, so with that, we leave you. That'll be it for this segment of the Ann Arbor Shield. Thanks for joining us, and we should be seeing you after the first of the year. Melissa is going on maternity leave and leaving us all behind, but we'll look for you after the first of the year. Thank you again to uh, our guest, Officer Schneider, for joining us. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Stay safe.